Welcome to Hindu Analysis, September 25, 2018. So today we are going to discuss all these articles. So the first article is Supreme Court verdict on September 25 on barring politicians facing criminal charges from contesting polls. So what this article deals about is it is that is the Supreme Court go, is going to give its verdict on September 25 that is today on barring the politicians from contesting in the election itself if they are facing the criminal offence charges. Okay, a petition was filed to bar the politicians who are facing the charges of heinous crimes like murder, rape and kidnapping from contesting in elections itself and then transforming themselves into parliamentarians or legislatures in state legislative assemblies etc. That is a petition was filed in order to curb the rights of the persons who are facing the criminal charges against them from contesting in elections both in parliament as well as in the state legislative assemblies. Why? Because to keep the criminals at bay and prevent the criminal from contesting in elections in both parliaments as well as in the state legislatures and to help the society to prevent criminalization of politics at the very entry, entry point itself that is at the initial stage itself you have to prevent them from participating in polls and all okay so what the Supreme Court's point of view is a Supreme Court judge observed that Parliament is there to make the law and the Supreme Court and the High Court are there to declare the law and the court is not having the rights to make the law it is only the Parliament duty that is what the Supreme Court judge recently observed if you see whether we have any laws for these kind of cases means yes that is one thing is ROPA which is the representation of People's Act in that they stated the convicted lawmakers are disqualified and not the accused ones which means whoever is proven to be guilty for their crimes they are actually are barred from contesting in elections and not the accused ones that is if you are putting some case against them then it is not a ground for them in barring them from uh, contesting in election and all only the convicted persons are barred from the elections so if you see in this picture these are the constitutional disqualification that is what are the disqualifications stated in the constitution itself for the members who are contesting in elections so this article 101 is dealing with the members of parliament and 191 is for the members who are for the state legislatures okay so a a person is being disqualified for being chosen as or for being that means in future also he is not uh, chosen as a member and at present also he should not be a member if he is holding any office of profit which is declared by the parliament and if he is of unsound mind and if he is an insolvent that is proved and if he is not a citizen or if he voluntarily occurs a citizenship of another country and the last one is if he is disqualified under the law which is made by the parliament itself. So these are the five criteria for disqualifying the members from contesting in elections in both parliament as well as in the state legislatures. Okay. So what is the Supreme Court's point of view here is how murder and rape accuse that persons can qualify to take an oath in parliament as well as in the state legislature under the schedule 3. That is if he is an accused then how he is having the right to take the oath under schedule 3 of the constitution. That is one question and under article 1021E as we see before. So a parliament is obliged to make a law and if any person is coming under the ambit of that parliament law then he is disqualified. So the supreme court as a consigned keeper of the constitution, so uh, supreme court is the keeper of the constitution so they can ask the parliament to make any law and apply that law to any persons who is contesting in elections. Okay. So these are the supreme court's point of view. So this slide is uh, which we saw before that, that is these are the constitutional disqualification for member of parliament that is 102 and member of state legislature that is 191. So these are the criteria. Okay. So the next article is center rose to broadcast stern warning on lynching. So we all know that the mob lynchings is uh, increasing day by day. And we all know that the article 15 of the Indian constitution which is protecting the citizens from discrimination on the basis of religion, caste, sex, gender etc. So you should not discriminate. This is under article 15. But the recent mob lynching incidents is against that. That means the mob lynchings or the targeted violence against a particular religion, people, particular caste, people etc. So it is violating the article 15 itself. So the Supreme Court on July 17 gave a verdict in order to ensure the pluralistic social fabric of the country as well as to save the innocent lives from the mob violence or the mob fury. So what that Supreme Court's verdict is, it is actually gave some 
punitive as well as the preventive measures for the mob lynching activities. So if you see in case of preventive measures, it is including the directions on broadcasting warnings that is using radio, television and other social media platforms as well as the official websites of the home departments. What uh, each and uh, every state and the center should do is it should send the message that lynching and the mob violence of any kind shall invite serious consequences under the law. So if any person is going to practice this mob lynching activity, then he is inviting serious consequences under the stringent law. And now the center is going to make it even more uh, stringent and it is going to make it in a full fledged way. That is now it is planning to broadcast these kind of warnings using this all the social medias and radio television etc in a full fledged way. That is the news. So the next article is long road ahead on Aishman Bharat scheme. So Aishman Bharat scheme is a health protection scheme and it aims to provide provide universal health coverage and it is also guaranteed access to the treatment which is very free at the point of delivery itself like uh, it is going to establish some health and wellness center so that the people can easily reach there and get the treatment or get the adequate facilities and nearly 40 percent of our country's population is coming under the ambit of this Aishman Bharat scheme and this 40 percent is derived on the basis of SCCC which is the socio-economic cost census and this Aishman Bharat under this it is a two component or it has two initiatives one is the insurance component another one is the establishment of health and wellness center so in that health and wellness center they are going to give the treatment they are going to give the adequate facilities to the 40 percent of the people and in the insurance component nearly 10 crore family are getting an annual of 5 lakh cover under the Pratan Mandri Jan Aroke Yojana so these are the two components of Aishman Bharat so what are the concerns of the scheme means allocation of just 2000 crore for covering the large segment of our Indian population. So it is not possible because it cannot provide the promised cover to this much amount of larger population. Similarly, not all the states and the union territories are in a position to raise their own share in order to provide the adequate funding to the health and the health and the wellness center as well as for the insurance. So without adequate budgetary commitment itself, the, it is like taking some kind of financial risk through insurers or state run trusts as well as the societies and this uh, again led to the outcomes which are very uncertain so we are not sure whether it is going to yield the desired result or not. Also, the costs are the contested area between the care providers and the center. That is, the care providers means the hospitals and the wellness centers and the center that is the government. It is always a, a kind of a competition between these two and certain hospitals which are only for profit motive, they are not, uh, that means feeling good about this Oishman scheme itself. Okay. So, these are all the concerns of the implementation of the Oishman Bharat scheme. So, we are having Clinical Establishment Act 2010. Under this, it is aiming to regulate the hospital sectors as well as standardization of the facilities as well as the reasonable rates for the procedures which is followed in the hospitals so these are the provisions under this act and it is to be followed by all the states as much as what we expected so that is what the major concern here so what is the very forward here is instead of putting pressure on the secondary as well as the tertiary hospital we have to reduce the pressure there and we have to invest more in preventive as well as the primary care facilities and there should be a proper roadmap for the universal health coverage by means of upgrading the public public sector infrastructures itself and we have to include more private uh, private hospitals as well as uh, to work along with the public hospitals and there should be a defined and adequate preparation for such kind of implementation. So if you see in this picture actually who is the one who is financing the health insurance for the people in the country for the recent years means then mostly it is out of pocket expenditure which means the people are spending their own money so it is uh, nearly like 67 percent of the people are spending their own money for their health care facilities and only the 22 percent are provided by the government health insurance schemes and the local bodies and other schemes are only seven percent and private is only very mega that is four percent as we have seen before that is 100 million families uh, or the beneficiaries and five lakh coverage and it is based on socio-economic caste census and it is funded like 60-40 that is 60% of the fund is given by the center and 40% is given by the every state okay for its implementation and it is merged with other state schemes so that it is uh, working in tandem and it should be implemented through an insurance company or trust or society etc and if you see 
in implementing this uh, Aishman Bharat, there are a lot of unforeseeable challenges like enrollment of ghost beneficiaries and treatment of diseases in a hospital which is not at all equipped properly or the hospital is not even having the proper infrastructure and the equipments and the doctors performing unnecessary procedures and even charging the fees even though it is a cashless scheme. So it is a cashless scheme but the doctors are charging. So it is, these are all the unforeseeable challenges which the government should properly focus and plan accordingly. So the next article is center finalizing the tariffs on non-essential imports that is we all knew that the trade deficit of our economy is widening actually but in order to reduce that either we have to increase the export or we have to reduce the import but as of now the government couldn't be able to export as much as what we expected so the another alternative way that is to reduce the import they are actually planning to impose some kind of tariffs on the non-essential goods like electronics gems and steel etc and as well as the imported apples almonds so these are some of the non-essential items so they are putting some tariffs on that so that the import is getting reduced so that our uh, rupee that is depreciation of a rupee against the us dollar will become strengthened okay so the next article is an indefensible ordinance so last week the president promulgated muslim women protection of rights on marriage ordinance 2018 so stating that there is an uh, urgency as well as compelling necessity for the promulgation of such ordinance. So stating this, they actually promulgated an ordinance. So this is called as triple talaq ordinance. But what the news here is, this ordinance is bound to fail the test of judicial scrutiny on several grounds. That is, it is not defensible. Why the ordinance is promulgated? Is there really any necessary condition for such promulgation? So it is not uh, actually provable or it is not defensible. So that is what this article states about. So what is an ordinance means? It is a constitutional mechanism and it is a temporary mechanism. So consider a very critical urgent situation is there, but the parliament or state assembly is not there in session but the government cannot wait till it reassembles so it has to face that critical situation legislatively so that is where this ordinance comes into effect now the president is actually promulgating this triple talaq ordinance okay so what are the concerns here is there is no documentary evidence for the increase in triple talaq incidents that is there is no alarming level of increase in the triple talaq incidents in the country so why they are actually promulgating this is one question and next one is article 123 which asks the president to ensure that there exists some emergency or urgent situation so only the president is promulgating any ordinance but in this situation there is no such urgent situation at all in the country for this triple talaq so why actually he is promulgating so this is also a major question so if you see here there are four major uh, concerns or the flaws in the promulgation of the ordinance so what are they we are going to see one by one the first one is the internal contradiction in the ordinance itself if you open that ordinance document there it has lot of provisions right but in that provisions itself there are lot of contradictions like section 2b of ordinance states saying triple talaq uh, that means talaq three times is making it instantaneous as well as irrevocable divorce that means if you say triple talaq, uh, talaq three times then it is uh, applied suddenly as well as it is not revocable so this is what section 2b states but section 3 of ordinance state that this kind of pronouncing three times talaq is not uh, valid and it is void and illegal so the two sections or the provisions under the ordinance itself is contradicting to each other so how the pronouncement can be void as well as irrevocable at the same time so this is the first First major contradiction or the flaw in the ordinance so also in the same ordinance itself in section 4 they are stating this triple talaq uh, practice is uh, inviting three-year imprisonment and fine for this kind of act but under section 7 what they are stating is this triple talaq is the cognizable as well as the non-bailable offense so it is also contradicting that is it is non-bailable as well as it is if you pay fine you can easily come out so these are also contradicting in the ordinance so these are the internal contradictions of the triple talaq ordinance so this is the first flaw the second one is more violations of the constitution so the constitution has provided certain kind of fundamental rights to the citizens it is always putting the fundamental rights in a higher pedestal than any other rights but 
so how this triple talaq ordinance is violating the constitution itself means we all knew that the parliament is not competent to enact any law which is inconsistent with the fundamental rights if it is a fundamental right or the parliamentary law means then the fundamental right is prevailing more so under this situation article 13 uh, states that the state that is our country shall not make any law which is abridging the fundamental rights which is provided under the part Three, that is the fundamental rights of the constitution. Else, if that means if it is abridging the fundamental right, then it is declared as void. This is one thing. And Article One Twenty Three Three, it states that if Parliament couldn't be able to make any law, then on the same subject, ordinance via ordinance also you cannot make any law. So that is what all uh, stated in this Article One Twenty Three. So these two are getting now violated by this triple talaq right. It is actually violating the fundamental right of the citizen. He is actually free to choose what he is uh, supposed to do. But now this is restricted under this triple talaq as well as now ordinance is making on certain subject which the parliament is not making law. So parliament cannot make law. Ordinance also cannot make law on that subject. But it is now doing. So these are the violations. And similarly, Article Twenty One and Article Nineteen, these two also uh, the fundamental rights like no person deprived of his personal liberty. But here we are arbitrarily curtailing the personal liberty of the person itself, even without committing any offence. He is not committing offence. He is saying that talaq three times, but stating this as an offence, it is putting his freedom under restriction. Similarly, Article Nineteen. it ensures the free movement of the individual throughout the territory of india and he can practice any profession or religion or occupation or trade or business it is also under restriction now under this triple talaq ordinance and the third one is ordinance fails on supreme court stance that means supreme court previously stated certain kind of verdicts but now this ordinance uh, overturned all those things so like in menha gandhi case as well as in the puttaswami case in these two cases what they are stating is law any law it should be a reasonable law and it should not just an enacted piece of statement kind of a thing so any law should be fair just and it should be reasonable but this ordinance is not coming under this ambit itself so criminalizing the mere pronouncement of talaq 3 times is actually violating the principle of substantive due process any due process should be just and fairness uh, to the citizens but it is not ensuring the just and fairness itself right so it is uh, again a flaw so the last one is no consensus between the lok sabha as well as in the rajya sabha the upper house is not actually accepting to this ordinance itself but they are still promulgating this ordinance this shows that there is no consensus or no uh, cooperation between the lower house and the upper house itself article 123 we know that it empowers the president to promulgate an ordinance only when an urgent situation arise that is during the recess of the parliament but no such emergency came into light as of now and lack of consensus among the parties that is due to that they are not tabling this uh, ordinance itself in rajya sabha and they are directly bypassing the rajya sabha and they just promulgated so it didn't having the approval of the rajya sabha itself so by uh, means of doing this ordinance they undemocratically circumvented the normal parliamentary procedure only for the sake of serving the political interest of the ruling party so these are all the flaws which can be visibly seen during this uh, recent triple talaq ordinance so we all knew that under article 123 any ordinance should be laid before both the houses of the parliament and uh, even if the parliament is in recess then after reassembling it should table that this has to be done in the future and if you see here in krishna kumar versus state of bihar case in that he actually promulgated the same ordinance for a lot of time and supreme court stated that tabling ordinance in parliament is a mandatory constitutional obligation and if you bypass that if you promulgated or repromulgated the ordinance for n number of time without tabling it is a violation of the constitution itself okay so ultimately it, it is the legislature that is it is not the president it is not the court but it is the legislature which determines the need and validity and the expediency of the uh, ordinance or the need for the promulgation of the ordinance legislature should decide when should an ordinance should be passed or when should it be revoked everything it is not the president or the supreme court so if so then it is an abuse of the constitutional process and it is a serious dereliction of the constitutional obligation itself so what is the way forward here is the president or the governor they should not act as a parallel source of law making or an independent legislative authority they are not a parallel source of legislature so keeping in mind that they will examine the legal infirmities of this ordinance which is it is suffering from and they should withdraw this ordinance as soon as possible
So the next article is nutrition norms issued to tackle SAM, which is the severe acute malnutrition. So the India's top nutrition panel, which is the National Technical Board on Nutrition, it approved the guidelines which is provided by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. So in that guidelines, what they are stating is severely malnourished children should be fed with freshly cooked and prepared food, which is available from locally uh, available cereals, pulses as well as the vegetables and it should be distributed by the Anganwadi centers and it is a part of the community based health management of the children who are suffering from this severe acute malnutrition. So under the same guidelines what they are stressing is the Anganwadi workers and the auxiliary nurse midwives they are the responsible persons and they should identify the children who are suffering from this severe acute malnutrition and they should identify them and they should segregate them and they should send them to the nearest healthcare facility as well as the nutrition rehabilitation center. So these are the work that should be done by these people and and the remaining children that is the children who are not affected by this malnutrition problem but they are not having adequate facilities those children are enrolled in community based management so that they can get nutrition antibiotics and counseling sessions as well as nutrition and health education for them so this under the same guidelines they actually wanted to revise a method of calculating the weight which is based on the height of the children instead of the upper arm uh, circumference that is before they are calculating using that but now they changed it to based on height you calculate the weight of the children so this is also changed under the new guidelines and which is proposed by ministry of women and child development so the next article is south south cooperation at the united nations so the 73rd united nations general assembly is taking place now so despite of the backdrop of increased american hostility towards the world body especially against multilateralism in general that is trump is now against the multilateralism concept itself and he is going towards the protectionism attitude right so he is putting america first so despite all these things now this united nations general assembly's meeting is happening so as america's role in this united nations is now decreasing the security council's prominence is also diminished now so in the midst of this situation our presence that is our external affairs ministers present in the united nations is providing an edge over the other developed countries like our external affairs ministers focus is especially on climate change digital infrastructure sustainability as well as in the south south cooperation and also for strengthening the cooperation especially in the areas of commerce pharmaceuticals and cyber security and defense as well as in the culture so the last article is female circumcision issue goes to the constitutional bench so there raised a petition to ban the practice of this female genital mutilation which is followed by or which is practiced by the Dawoodi Boras so these are the sect of people and this Dawoodi Bora Women's Association this stated that this uh, female circumcision practice is a practice which is very essential for their religion and it had been continuing since the 10th century so it is very essential part of our religion so you should not ban this this is what this association stated but for that what the supreme court now telling is practice of this method which is calves so it is also known as calves so it is prevalent in this sect and it amounts to female genital mutilation and it is a violation of the women's right to life and dignity itself and if you practice this it leaves permanent emotional and mental scars in an young girl so it is affecting their fundamental right itself right so the constitution never allows any person to injure another person so it, they are now doing or practicing this so any practice should be tested in the light of the constitutional morality rather than the religious basis this is what the supreme court telling so now this petition is coming under the purview of the constitutional bench thank you